Uh, first, uh, we study a bullying experience of Muslim and United States. Uh, the importance of the study uh, comes from the number of increase, uh, the, the increasing number of Muslim in the United States. Uh, there is a currently uh, about 7 million Muslim in the United States. And <clears throat> the, re the studies shows that uh, Muslim are experiencing stigma and discrimination uh, increased, especially after uh, 11, uh, 9 11 and uh, ISIS uh, and uh, the growth of ISIS. And the study aims uh, is uh, to, <clears throat> to explore bullying experience of Muslim students in schools, college, and universities, uh, causes and uh, consequences of uh, religious. Uh, and uh, the, this study is a qualitative study. Um, the methodology was, uh, the, the sample was uh, uh, about uh, 50 participants and uh, they are age of uh, 18 or older. And <clears throat> they were, uh, participating from schools and uh, high school, and, uh, from uh, un universities and high school. And the interviews were connect conducted via uh, telephone calls or face-to-face um, -face and, uh, 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 and a questionnaire online, where ha which has uh, open-ended questions. Uh, Go ahead, Khadija, and start the result, please. Thank you. If you could load, I uh, low down on the demographics. So um, the demographics were that about 18% had lived here less than 10 years, uh, 37, you know, about 11 to 20 years, and 22%, 20 to 30 years, and 22%, uh, 31 and more years. Um, Wafa, if you can, I move the screen up a bit, so thanks. So <clears throat> the results were a very troubling of our studying of experiences of bullying of Muslims in schools. So they reported um, either they had gone through it when they were in school or they knew somebody that had gone through bullying. And most, a lot of the data was that in schools, um, they were accused of being terrorists, like quotes like how many bombs are in your bag today and kids at school would ask other kids, is your family part of ISIS? Um, there was one um, respondent who was a Muslim student. He went to study physics um, in a friend's house who wasn't Muslim. And I guess the friend's father came in to the room and uh, when they were studying and then his uh, asked his son, did, um, the respondent recruit you to study physics to teach you how to make bombs. Um, and so another thing that was very predominant in the study was Muslim girls. Um, often their hijabs were made fun of or their scarves were pulled off um, or things like very troubling quotes like, um, you know, do you wear hijab because you're ugly? Uh, you know, really ignorant questions like, do you wear this when you go to sleep or do you wear this when you take a shower? And so the Muslim girls with hijab really went through a lot. And then the social isolation was tremendous for many of these Muslim kids. Many of them um, moved to Islamic schools as a result of all the bullying they were getting in um, public schools. And they reported that that was the reason they their parents sent them to Islamic schools. Um, the parents uh, talked about their kids having depression, anxiety, and feelings of isolation. And I remember there was one quote of one child had to see a psychiatrist. He had uh, some sort of suicidal ideation um, because he was so isolated. The Muslim kids talked about not having enough friends in school or even a friend in school. And um, one quote, this was a kid who used to, I think, swim, and they made fun of him when he was swimming. And he said, I refrain from participating in activities typically I'm interested in. 
I feel less uh, like I'm less American and I have to change something about myself to be accepted. Um, and so their academic performance, there were some Muslim students, well, a number of them whose grades were like really high and then their grades dropped substantially. Um, <clears throat> and so it impacted their grades. Um, one uh, respondent said, I'm afraid going to school and it impacts my learning ability with other parents saying their kids hate to go to school and some parents saying they moved their kids to homeschooling or uh, kids had to change schools or take online courses instead because of the bullying. So the recommendations, Wafa, if you can go down uh, quickly. Uh, recommendations are basically is that we need to educate non-Muslims uh, about Islam and humanize Muslims more and present uh, the lives of Muslims in ways that make them more understandable and that schools need to address uh, um, racism and Islamophobia within schools and that we have to increase interfaith collaborations and maybe have open houses at mosques where we invite neighbors and Americans to get to know each other better and invite you know, school classes to the mosques. And then going down, Wafa, if you can just lower it a bit. Um, the social, because we're in social work, uh, one of the things is that um, they felt that social work and mental health professionals need to be able to, um, uh, be hired more in schools to address counseling needs of, of kids in schools as well, and that we need more bullying legislation um, so that people who are bullying other kids can also face charges. Thank you, we're, we're done. Um, thank you, Dr. Khadija Khaja and Dr. Wafa Al Hadri for that presentation. Um, we can save a Q and A till the end. If there well, is we well, actually, can, do you mind if we have? I mean, while it was fresh in our mind and yeah, looking yeah. at, can we have discussion now? Mm -hmm. that's, that's okay with the presenters. Um, so, I, I, yeah, thanks for sharing that. So. Um, I had several questions about, um, for one thing, in background, I think it'd be useful when you guys hopefully publish this, you know, bring in, you know, ISPU, the Institute for Social Policy Understanding, has published quite a bit on bullying. Um, and what one of the interesting findings is that they found that a lot of Muslim parents complained that the teachers themselves would bully. And so the, you know, so, you know, they, they, it's, a, it's a much more profound um, problem. And so a couple questions I had was um, that, you know, so this is, I can say the Indiana um, affiliations, IU affiliations. I think it's important to kind of contextualize where the uh, study was conducted in terms of, are we talking about rural Andy, Indiana? Are we talking about Indianapolis? It might, it might make a difference. I mean, that's pretty hardcore Trump country. Um, and then also, how did you recruit the students? Is this a convenience sample? Is this from do you recruit people from from the um, from the com from the community randomly? Um, and so that that's I mean, so in other words, is there kind of a selection bias of people who want to report their bullying, or are these people who I mean, so that, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Um, the other question I had more about sorry, one last question is about the demographics. Um, it'd be worth getting to more depth of the demographics in terms of race, age, um, gender, in that, you know, if, if let's say, as example, 60% of them were African-American or, or white, they would have a different, perhaps a different experience um, because they, they may not, they might pass for something different as opposed to someone who's brown or um, you know, so forth and so on. Um, I'll answer the questions really quick because we have a minute and we've got two of the presentations. Um, so yeah, we have demographic data because of the poster, it's not on here, but we do have demographic data on mm -hmm. the students. Um, we also, the data was collected in Indiana and uh, the data was collected um, via uh, our emails to recruit samples went out to Muslim organizations and like the advocacy project, and they sent it out to the Muslim community. Um, and that's how um, we recruited people as well. So it went out to many Muslim organizations. And I had a question for you. You said IS, who has published on bullying? You said it really quickly. Institute for Social Policy Understanding, ISPU. 
Okay. And and mm -hmm. where is that located? Um, I think they're based in Michigan, but if you go to ISPU, I think dot org, you'll see a bunch of reports. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. And I would uh, uh, give you a hint about the uh, demographic here. The blue, the blue chart, the chart here, indicate to white, and the red indicate to African American, and the green indicate to uh, um, the. This one indicate to Arab, and uh, the yellow color indicate to Asian, and the orange indicate to uh, South Asian. Yeah, I mean, it'd be, it'd be interesting to see how much race does play a role in this uh, from your qualitative data. In other words, if you're if you're a black kid. Are you marked as Muslim or as black? Is are you being picked on because you're black or because you're Muslim? And obviously, if you're, you're a boy versus a girl, girl, if they if they do or do not wear hijab, so I, I think some of those things you want to explore in your in your results and discussion. Yeah, some of the African kids um, they got bullied one because they were black and also because they were Muslim. So it was uh, a double intersection. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mufai, did you want to close the screen for the next presenter? Okay, so next we have um, understanding the relationship between religious belonging and substance use uh, from Minhagani, Ahmad Asin, Harun Dosani, Selin Morsh, who are all researchers at Safa Institute, and um, Hanan Shem, who is a doctoral candidate and counseling psychology at the University of Texas, Austin. Go ahead and get started when you guys are ready. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, so for the past year, we at Safa Institute um, have been working on a research study to better understand the relationship between belonging and substance use in young adult Muslim populations. So a little bit more about the organization. Um, Safa Institute is a local nonprofit in the Austin area, and our main mission is to really improve the pipeline of quality mental health services for young adult um, Muslims. So some of the stuff that we've been working on for the past year includes conducting a needs assessment, which is for our research, to better understand the barriers to seeking mental health services, some of the mental health issues that are most prominent, and the frequencies of use and other factors that contribute to this relationship. A couple of the other things that we've been working on include hosting cultural responsiveness trainings for local therapists in the area so they better understand the needs and complexities of dealing with their Muslim clientele and are better suited to um, address any of their concerns. And with those therapists who've gone through the CEU training, we are creating a network of therapists for our own communities to access and to seek out for therapy. We've also been providing consultations for anyone who might be considering therapy and have questions about it. And that's free of charge um, since we do fundraise to compensate and help out our community. We're also working on a fund to help support therapy sessions since many people who are young adults can't actually afford them. And we additionally provide educational resources and materials um, to, for our community as well. Sorry, it's showing up a little weird, but um, so for our research, the main factors that we're going to be focusing on in this presentation um, are, um, are substance use and belonging. So we look at many different levels of belonging in this research, um, such as community belonging, American community belonging, religious community belonging, and so on. And some of the past research on substance use in Muslim American adults um, includes that the rates of substance use are very similar to their non-Muslim peers. And... Um, um, even though the rates are similar, there's like an inc there's an increased um, feeling of shame and guilt for young Muslims due to it being a religious restriction and a cultural taboo, which um, then in turn makes it increasingly difficult for Muslim adults to seek out this help that they need and creates health disparities. And a reason that substance use is um, a risky behavior in Muslims is because it is culturally forbidden um, in, and religiously. Um, 
So community belonging is one of the factors that we're going to be looking at today. And past research has shown that it can be a protective factor against substance use for minority populations, which in America, Muslim Americans are. And other research has also found that Muslims living in a community with fewer drinkers in their social network are associated with less substance use. Other benefits of belonging um, include uh, the emotional assistance and feelings of inclusion that you get from belonging in a community. And belonging to a religious group specifically has also been shown to enhance your mental health by providing meaning and purpose and encouraging positive social interactions. So in order to conduct the study, we, um, we, kind of, we, we conducted a survey uh, through convenience snowball sampling, kind of advertising through social media, listservs, and then our own personal contacts. And all of our participants are given an option to enter in a raffle for a $20 Amazon gift card. And for our set of measures, we, we had, um, oh, I don't know why the formatting keeps getting weird when I converted to PowerPoint, sorry about that. But um, we had four general sets of measures. So our first one being demographic measures, asking things like sex, age, socioeconomic status, immigration status, and a few other measures. Um, our next set of measures looked more at mental health determinants. Um, so we measured psychological distress through the 53 item brief symptom inventory. We also measured um, uh, barriers to access and care through the 30 item base scale. And we also measured uh, mental health seeking intentions um, through the three item mental health seeking intention scale. Um, our next set of measures focus more on belonging. So we looked at the psychological sense of belonging using SOBI. Uh, we also had our own three questions using a seven point Likert scale to measure belonging to the religious community, the general American community and the masjid. So in this case, I feel belonging to my religious community, to my general American community and to my masjid. Um, we also measured um, alcohol, smoking, and general substance use uh, with the WHO's assist scale. Um, yes, and and then come uh, and and uh, yeah. So our general results that we got. Um, so we had about eight, 185 participants, all between the ages of 18 and 29 years old. Our average age is about 23, with a standard deviation of about 3.2 years. Um, majority of our participants are female, and they were majority are also second generation immigrants. And uh, most of our participants were middle class, uh, followed, I guess, almost equally by upper middle class and working class. And in terms of the racial background uh, breakup of our study, uh, majority was South Asian, Middle Eastern, North African. Um, we also had a significant East uh, and Southeast Asian population, as well as a Black African American population. We had about 3.2% being multiracial, and then these smaller slivers that are not labeled are white and Hispanic and Latino. And um, looking at the frequencies, so from our study, um, tobacco, alcohol, cannabis, and sedatives were the most common substances used. And um, holding all else constant, Muslim belonging, uh, belonging to the Muslim community was the largest and only protective factor, uh, per, sorry, predictor of um, substance use in Muslim young adults. So um, based on some on these results, some of the things that we discussed um, was that first off, we found that substance use is is common in the Muslim emerging adult community. And the percentage we found was 44%. Um, the asterisk there is to note that underreporting in the Muslim community is very common due to uh, sampling uh, to uh, response bias and social desirability and bias as well. Um, um, so what, what this showed is that uh, we found that those community belonging significantly predicted whether or not um, participants engage in substance use, asked for like why this is the case. We did some research into other religious communities. And um, the main reason that we found um, was that spirituality on its own is not a significant uh, uh, influence on behavior change or that's preventing or encouraging substance use. But when coupled with um, a sense of community, spirituality can um, influence whether or not a person is, is uh, engaged in substance use um, and help serve as a protective factor in other uh, communities. Um, so the, in contrast to this, we found that there's uh, a, almost a, a large lack of resources for Muslims dealing, you know, so dealing with substance use inside the United States. Um, there's the Malati Islami movement, which is a 12-step model for Muslims. They have online and in-person meetings and they do really great work. There's also a book coming out by some authors um, from the Taiba Foundation. Um, that the first one's called The 12 Steps for the Muslim. And the last thing I wanted to point out was the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration Services has recently really encouraged um, in, uh, the increase uh, in development of faith-based resources 
for those dealing with substance use and helping add and to engage and increase uh, community health, community belonging. Next slide. So um, some of the limitations we found um, that we did mention a bit earlier was the social desirability bias. So um, it was pretty common and um, shown that underreporting of substance use was uh, shown to be less because of stigma or taboo reasons. Um, the next thing was um, response bias. Um, during our collection of data, we were told um, by some participants that, and uh, some non-participants that they, the reason that they did not take the survey was because there was uh, questions about their substance use involved. Um, and uh, then uh, another limitation would be our method of collecting data, which was snowball and convenience sampling. So we mainly distributed our survey through social media and other Muslim organizations. Um, and so those are mainly um, uh, Muslim focused organizations. So we didn't hit any, I guess, non-participant Muslim members. And also snowball um, sampling where we we were not we, to access the community members that uh, we ourselves did not have direct access to. We engaged with other uh, members in the community that can collect data on our behalf. And um, lastly, uh, the last uh, limitation that we had was um, the overrepresentation of Middle Eastern, North African, and South Asian descent, and the need, uh, I guess, for more um, uh, other Muslim subgroups that we did not hit, um, including the African American and Hispanic Latino Muslim community that we wish we could have hit more. So for future research uh, um, that, that we'd like to see as a mainly a more representative sample of Muslim Americans, we'd really like to get a better sample and representation of uh, a community such as the African American Muslim community, um, the white American Muslim community, convert community, um, that we did not get to see as much as a majority, as, as much as involvement in our current uh, study. Um, another uh, aspect that we'd like to see uh, research on is the ethnic and cultural factors um, that can serve as predict, uh, predictive or protective factors um, on stigmas and barriers to care. Um, also, um, the relationship between stigma and barriers to accessing care and, and how they influence um, substance use within the Muslim community. And lastly, um, what we hope to do and um, want to see as well is an increase in community-based interventions that increase a sense of belonging within uh, the Muslim community um, to help prevent risk behaviors. Um, such as like group therapy for Muslims or increase in Islamic psychotherapy um, or other methods for um, uh, engaging and, and treating the Muslim community. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that presentation. Um, does anyone have any questions for this group of panelists? Okay, I have several questions. I was hoping other people would talk, but as is no one else is talking. Uh, a couple questions. One is, um, am I wondering why focusing on substance use as opposed to abuse or dependence? Um, you know, I, I think that would be probably more clinically relevant and, um, and, I th and, and important. Um, the other thing is, I, it, I think it's very important to, you know, it's given, especially given it's a convenience sample to add a religious religiosity scale just because you're probably oversampling more religious Muslims. And so, which would be interesting. I mean, if you're, you're just seeing more alcohol use among them, um, that'd be important too. And then we know from, you know, Samir Ahmed and Cindy Arfkin's work that people who are more religious, and in fact, your data suggests people who are more connected to the Muslim community, presumably are more religious, um, also, um, uh, are, are this protective factor for using substance abuse, uh, for using substances. I think, I, but I think that kind of, I think the main issue is distinguishing between substance use is there's a huge difference between someone who's experimenting, trying it, you know, once or twice versus someone who's abusing it, which again, is more clinically relevant. So I just wanted, was that, was it, did you give me a deliberate choice or was that something that um, you guys have data on or where are you with that? So I think I, I just want to add something to I think it's Hamada's question. I think substance use and substance abuse are two different questions. I mean, your study looks like it was looking at substance use, um, not substance abuse. So I think those are two different questions. And I think one of the things in the research on substance use within Muslims is we actually have very little data on substance use in Muslims. So um, 
you know, that could be a, a, a later data set, but I, I thought it was actually really excellent and very interesting, your findings. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Dr. Mata, for the question. Uh, I think I can take this one for you know, if you don't mind. So uh, we actually, yeah, well, that was a huge discussion and almost like um, we had it with substance abuse and substance use, especially, I mean, we're uh, publishing to um, like, I guess a non-Muslim specific general substance use isn't really seen as like risk behavior. Um, the reason we chose to focus on it as particularly in this study was um, one, like, I think we just wanted to focus on the aspect of religiously it's forbidden. And I guess like, as that reason, we wanted to see how many Muslims are kind of engaging and kind of distressed by behavior that they're not supposed to be part of. And uh, substance abuse, um, we actually, we actually to, that's, that's a great point that about measuring um, substance like abuse as a measure. Um, the who is this, the the results we found were a bit still uh, I guess like inconclusive of like substance abuse particularly, but um, um, that's also something that we didn't like look into as much. Um, you was your next question was about uh, oh, um, Shafat, if you don't mind, I just want to also um, add to that the, to that answer specifically. So the who assist um, measure. And it measures both frequency um, and also risk level. And so it splits the results into low, medium, and high risk based off of frequency of use. Um, but unfortunately, there wasn't like large enough power there and significance for us to really use it in the results. And so that's another reason that. So we did look into that to see if it was possible that we do some analysis with that, but it wasn't as um, significant. Well, so that's great that you collected that. So I, I, even if you if you don't have the power to analyze it, reporting descriptives that you did look at it, but we didn't have the, you know, enough numbers. And just to, I mean, just because you want, you know, hopefully this gets published, but I think um, at least addressing that, because then because the peer reviewers they probably want to ask, well, out of those people who actually use, how much are them are they actually abusing? Uh, mm -hmm. And so. Um, yeah, that's yeah, a good so, point. We can definitely add that as a frequency to show what the, all the information we have. Right. Good. Thank you. Shafat, you were going to answer the other question. Oh, um, the other question, I, I just I just lost track of my mind. Uh, uh, what what we had a scale, um, like an Islamic scale. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, that was another, scale. yeah, that was another issue we had was that the Lusiasi scale, it's... Um, there was such a wide variety on what was considered as religiosity. So some people had pray five times a day. I remember, I, actually, Minha, I forgot that Minha might know better, but there was like something like pray five times a day and like paired with like hijab or some other like, so there's very, it's very um, a uh, subjective matter of what counts as religiosity. And so I actually like another kind of like limitation or need we saw was a need for, I guess, like a proper development of like a proper religious substance scale, a, pro a religiosity scale. With I guess I think the consultation of scholars and then also then um, uh, tested for reliability and validity because all the scales also didn't have that this was specifically for the Muslim uh, Islamic faith. Yeah, we did we did collect data on religious centrality and um, Islamic practices behavior. Um, so we did collect okay. those data on those two. We just didn't include it in this analysis, but that's something okay. that we can include moving forward. Yeah, definitely. I mean, again, if even if you have negative findings just show your reviewers that you you looked at it. Um, and, and, and just even descriptives, if, if in general, you have a more religious um, uh, sample, that's fine, just report it and say, you know, even in this more religious study uh, group of people, they're using substances more, you know, for more frequently than we anticipated given. By the way, 16% using alcohol is pretty low. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there were there were some people that we asked to take the survey who literally said we don't want to take it because you're asking us these questions, and so wow. that's that's very strong response bias. Yeah, that's very, that's very interesting. Uh, you know, and that's very important to report. Yeah, and just to add on to that, the um, I was I would gave the survey to someone. I was sitting there while they were taking it, and they looked at me and they said, "No, I'm not going to answer on this one." And I knew oh, like wow. the answer, and like we both knew, but they specifically just said they did not drink. <laughs> wow. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Um, I do have one question, actually, um, Dr. Amada, is can we, um, so when we think about writing this up as a paper, can we write that in the discussion in the limitations that there were part people that we asked to take the survey who specifically said they didn't want to answer that question? That yeah, absolutely. Okay. yeah, absolutely. You can yeah. write that in, yeah. in, the, in the limitation section. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.
it's a good study. I think it's it's uh, um, very rich data. And so I commend you for doing this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, well, if no one else has any other questions, um, I want to thank all the panelists who uh, presented their research to us today. And uh, that concludes the poster presentations. And I hope to see you all at some of our other panels uh, for the rest of the day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, hey, you guys. Bye. Isla, could you end this and everybody rejoin the meeting because we need to stop the file, okay? <sighs>